And we're continuing with the first chapter of the second part of The Other Side of the Sun by Madeline Wengel. What Honoria tried to keep simple, the aunts managed to manage to make complicated, but we did have tea with milk for Aunt Mary Densborough and me, and thin wheels of lemons stuck with cloves for Aunt Olivia and Aunt Irene. There were cucumber sandwiches, it didn't taste like English cucumber, and thinly sliced raisin cake, but I wasn't hungry, and I was relieved when Aunt Rhea came to the screen door and said that she had unpacked a few things for me, and perhaps I would like to go to my room. Aunt Irene started to rise, but Aunt Rhea said, I'll see that Miss Stella has everything she needs. Her voice was unlike any of the other strange, warm southern voices I had heard. It was deep and guttural, with a quality like some dark metal dug deep out of the center of the earth. I followed her into a vast, dusty, windswept room, or rather two rooms, one leading into the other, so that there was an open sweep from front veranda to back. The front room, shuttered and dim, contained a kind of ornately scrolled bamboo furniture, which came from India or China, or maybe both, I'm not sure. There was a day bed covered with an oriental rug, and above this a huge portrait of a, in a great gold frame of two young women in empire dresses. One was singing, the other accompanying her on a harpsichord, and though they must have been long dead, they reminded me of Aunt Olivia and Aunt Mary Densborough. I did not notice the dog and kitten on the day bed until Aunt Aria said, now this minute. I turned, startled, thinking she was talking to me, then saw an elderly Irish wolfhound and a small amber kitten slither to the floor, both looking guilty. Finbar, Honoria said, Mino, just because my back is turned and Miss Stella is arriving, don't give you no right to sit where you don't belong. Remember who and what you is. And the time is dark. She glanced from the animals to the portrait, fondling the old dog's ear. That Dr. Theron's mother, singing Miss Meadows, Dr. Theron and his aunt Olivia. Hugo, painted by the younger Mr. Peel when he was visiting Charleston. There were no other portraits in the front or living room, and also in the rear or dining room, and I anticipated there were other portraits in the front or living room and also in the rear or dining room, and I anticipated studying them and getting further acquainted with my husband's family. These people on the walls would be the ancestors of our children. I felt past, present, and future swirl around me like the sea breeze, which came through the screen door and brushed against my hot cheeks. Edward Seven was next, and soon we'll put George Five upon the throne. Theron and Mado had a son known as Thero by everyone. Between the two rooms was a wide staircase, which Honoria and I mounted. Then we climbed another, narrower flight of stairs, and went down a long, winding passage into a large and airy room that I knew at once I was going to love. It was five-sided because one corner was cut by long French windows that led to a triangular balcony overlooking sea and dunes. A tall brass bedstead, brightly polished with a white marseillaise bedspread, stood to the left of the French windows, and over it, attached to a brass ring, hung a roll of white netting, which my husband had told me I would have to let down at night to protect me from mosquitoes. A dry mahogany highboy was opposite the bed, a magnificent piece of furniture which had never been intended for ocean damp. The delicate veneer had cracked and buckled in several places. In one corner of the room, over a rattan chaise lounge, was a, was a daguerreotype of a young man and woman in sailing clothes, proudly displaying an enormous swordfish. Sun had burnished their skins, bleached their hair. They were smiling, and their eyes had the narrowed look I had seen on people who had spent many years in India, and become accustomed to half-closing their eyes against the glare. The young man with the engaging grin might almost have been, but it was not, Terry. They were, I guess, my husband's father and mother, Pharaoh and Kitty. I would have to learn to know them, these grandparents my children would never know. 
How long after that happy picture was taken had that little boat been caught in a swift and unexpected storm? All I knew about my husband's parents was that they had loved the sea and died in it. That there was a sound outside my door. Clive, Honoria's husband, and a young colored man came in with my boxes. Clive and Uncle Holdley had met me in Jefferson, and Clive had driven me to Illyria. A drive so long and hot that despite my delight in the lush strangeness of the scenery, I had slept most of the way. Clive, considerably shorter than Honoria, thin as wire, strong as wire too, I suspected. The younger Negro, he was much younger, was perhaps Terry's age, was tall and thin with steel-rimmed spectacles. Clive lowered the heavy box he was carrying and smiled his dignified smile. Miss Stella... I'd like you to make this acquaintance of my grandson. The young Negro bowed. I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Rainier. I'm Theron James. Theron. It still came as a shock, although Terry had, in a sense, prepared me that this tall, dark-skinned man, with a face as austere as his grandfather's, and a far more bitter twist to the mouth, should be another Theron. Here's another nursery rhyme for you, for you, Terry had said. Clive and Honoria, Honoria and Clive, keep Illyria's light alive. They had a son whose name was Jim. Jim had married, and from him came Terence Roll, came Terence Ronald, known as Tron. Then little Theron, nicknamed Ron. Ron spoke to his grandmother. I thought Miss Irene wanted Mrs. Rainier downstairs. I prefer Miss Stella here, Honoria said. Ron raised one eyebrow slightly. The the room Miss Irene had in mind was just across from Mr. Holdley's, and Mr. Holdley, he snore. He put that box there, please, Ron, so as I can tend to it. If you'd like to bathe after your journey, Miss Stella, I'll prepare a bath for you. A bath. Joy, I needed one. Honoria left the room simultaneously stiff and stately, indicating with one authoritative shoulder that Clive and Ron would have followed. Ron paused in the doorway. Miss Rainier, if Honoria tells you to do something, do it. Honoria is to be taken seriously. Well, yes, I said, of course. I did not understand him or anything about him. (coughs) Excuse me. Like Honoria, he moved like royalty. And he didn't sound like any of the soft and sultry voices I'd heard at the harbor in Jefferson or since my arrival in Illyria. His voice was cool and sounded strangely British. Miss Stella... Since you're new here, it might be better if you don't eat anything Honoria doesn't give you. At my look of surprise, he began to talk about change of diet, change of water, bothering some people, but it seemed to me that there was a definite edge of warning to his words. Before he closed the door behind him, he said, Your trunks will be on the train with Mr. Hoadley. Train gets in at six. Miss Irene may want you to change rooms, but you needn't. Again a warning, perhaps not, but how strange. I moved from his words, opened the shutters, and stepped out onto the wooden gingerbread balcony, which looked out over the jungle between Illyria and the beach. The sun was moving westward now, but the air was still molten with heat. I leaned on the balcony rail. The ornamented and carved wood was weather-worn, silver-gray, and had the fine texture of driftwood. The brilliant expanse of ocean darkened as a cloud moved across the sun. Breakers moved regally to the shore, rising, curving, falling in a hish of green foam. Mingling with the constant crashing of waves was the breeze and the palms. A cumbersome and clumsy bird with a large beak waddled along the edge of the water. It was so ludicrous in its ungraceful movements that I almost laughed, and suddenly it raised its head and soared up into the air in a glorious arc, and I was shamed. There came a rap at the open door of the balcony. Your bath is ready, Miss Stella. Honoria, I just saw a bird, a big 
an awkward ugly, and then he flew. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. That would be a pedican, Miss Stella. I laugh with pleasure. And we're going to do her with a proper British accent from this point on, and just the narration is a southern accent. Oh, well, Noria, I've never seen a pelican before, except in, a, in the London Zoo. I had no idea they were like that. Yes, Miss Stella, that is what a pelican is like. And we will stop there, as it is the end of the first chapter.